If you will take your Bibles and open with me to the book of Luke. It'll be in Luke chapter 22, down at verse 47 for our study together. Luke 22 and verse 47. <clears throat> we have been studying about the miracles of Jesus. And we're coming to the end of, uh, end of that journey. And of course to the end of Jesus' life here upon the earth. A lot has happened between the last miracle that we talked about and the one that we'll look at today uh, in, the life of, uh, in the life of Jesus. I want to mention as we get started that in our last lesson... We were talking about uh, the miracle of Jesus cursing the fig tree, and we spent some time at the beginning of that lesson talking about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and how the people, you know, took the palm branches from the trees and put before him, and their garments, their outer garments, they took off and laid on the ground before him, made, you know, a pathway welcoming him into the city and saying, Hosanna, calling him the king, uh, son of David. And in that miracle of cursing of the fig tree, we talked about how the tree looked like outwardly that it was producing fruit, but when you came close and expected it, there was no fruit on it. And we talked about how Jesus used that to illustrate the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, but we're going to see the real application of that miracle in today's lesson because those people who were cheering for Jesus and who were welcoming him in the city, they had the outward appearance of looking like those who loved the Lord, who accepted him as the Son of God, who couldn't wait for him to be their Savior and their Redeemer, but they were just a barren tree covered in leaves. They looked like they were in the right and had the right attitude and the right heart, but when you really examined them, there was no fruit. Well, in fact, there was fruit, but it was the wrong kind of fruit because that very same crowd, all those who chanted their approval for Jesus coming to the city in only a few days' time were the same ones who were chanting, crucify him. They completely turned against him. He was not the kind of king that they wanted. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom, not a physical one. And as he came into Jerusalem, he was welcomed, but when he began to clearly demonstrate to them who he was and what his purpose was, there was no fruit to be found in most of the citizens of Jerusalem. So Jesus faced many challenges in his final days from the Jewish leaders, from the Pharisees, obviously, from the Herodians, from the Sadducees, and even from the lawyers, the doctors of the law. We read about all of those events and all those confrontations following his entry into the city leading up to his crucifixion. Because of those things and that opposition that he faced, he announced and foretold the destruction of Jerusalem. In Matthew 24 and 25, Mark chapter 13, and also Luke chapter 21. He also realized the betrayal by one of his own. Judas, who outwardly looked like a loyal disciple, was in fact a barren fig tree. And he turned against the Lord and arranged for his betrayal. As they partook of the Passover meal in that upper room, Jesus, of course, instituted the Lord's Supper. He humbled himself to wash the feet of his disciples and then to encourage them to have the same attitude and service one toward another. And he gave a final discourse, a final sermon, lesson to his apostles in John chapters 14 through 17. And then Jesus and the twelve journeyed out of the city across the river into the Garden of Gethsemane. And after he prayed to the Father, Jesus, of course, was betrayed, he was arrested, and he was forsaken by his closest disciples. Again, outwardly, they looked like they were bearing fruit, but when you look very closely, it wasn't exactly what it needed to be. And Jesus has announced the doom of those who don't bear fruit for him. And even his own disciples forsook him and fled. Well, that brings us to the miracle that we're going to talk about today. There in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus was betrayed, um, uh, a, a terrible event took place, and Jesus acted in accordance with it. So I want us to read Luke 22, beginning in verse 47. The Bible says, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, 
went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. There's the miracle. And of course it tells us an amazing story and some very important lessons that we need to learn from it. Let's talk a little bit about these events that took place uh, here in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as we think about this miracle, I want us to think about, first of all, the miracle of inspiration. And when we first started this series on the miracles of Jesus, we, we started by talking about Old Testament prophecy and how those Old Testament scriptures foretold in very specific detail you know, the events of Jesus' life and his death and resurrection and all of those things. And it emphasized to us that the Bible didn't come from man, but it is, in fact, the Word of God. And here we have another example of that. When you take the different accounts of the events that occurred here in the garden, we find a very interesting story. In Matthew 26 and verse 51, for example, the Bible says, Behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand, and drew his sword, and struck a servant of the high priests, and smote off his ear. And so Matthew tells us, <clears throat> excuse me, that one of them cut off an ear of the servant of a servant of the high priest. Mark's account says basically the same thing in Mark chapter 14 and verse number 47. <clears throat> Read it really quickly. It says, One of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest. And cut off his ear. So again, a very simple statement that one of them cut off an ear of a servant of the high priest. Well, John's account tells us this in John 18 and verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So John adds to the story these details, that it was Peter. He was the one who drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest. He also tells us the servant's name, that his name was Malchus. And he adds the detail that we read in Luke also, that it was his right ear. So you have Matthew's account and Mark's account which give you know, very basic information. Luke's adds a little bit more, and then John adds a little bit more to, to the story. But Luke is the only one that records the miracle that took place, that after this servant was struck and his ear was cut off, Luke is the only account that tells us of Jesus restoring that part of his body uh, to him. Now, what does this tell us about the Bible? The psalmist wrote in Psalm 119 in verse 160, and this is the American Standard Version translation, but it, it sums up what it really means there. The sum, S-U-M, of thy word is truth. That when it comes to studying the Bible, we have to take the whole thing, right? We can't just take one little passage and then when, when John tells us something different, say, well, Matthew and John contradict one another. These two stories supplement one another and they add detail one to the other. And so we have to take the whole of what the Bible says about a situation. And we get into trouble sometimes when people want to just take one verse. There's one passage that they like or that fits them or that they think you know, justifies them in, in a certain situation. And they want to take that one verse and ignore everything else that the Bible has to say about the same subject. You know, that's true so often what happens in, in talking about salvation in the religious world, people will find a verse that talks about salvation by faith. And the Bible clearly teaches salvation by faith, that you must have faith to be saved. But that's easy. That's something that's very simple. And people latch on to faith. And so they say, well, the Bible teaches salvation by faith only. But again, the psalmist says, the sum of thy word is truth. It's true that you are saved by faith. But it's also true that we're saved by repentance and that we're saved by confession 
of the name of Christ and our faith in him and that we're saved by baptism. We have to take all of those things into account because the entire Bible is inspired, not just the parts that we like or the parts that fit us and what we want to be true. And so when it comes to the story of what happened here in the garden, you have to take all four gospel accounts to see the whole picture. And if you only take Matthew or Mark, you only get a limited view of what happens. And that's true of so many things in Scripture. If you just take John 3.16 and leave out Acts 2.38, you don't have a proper picture of salvation. Right? We have to take everything that the Bible says because it's his inspired word. So I think that's a powerful lesson that we learn from the story and how God has chosen to reveal his truth to men and why he's done it in the way that he has. So this miracle helps to to see that and to see the inspiration of the Bible. Let's also consider the uniqueness of, of this miracle. It's the only miracle recorded in Scripture in the life of Jesus that is the miracle of healing a wound that was caused by violence. So most of the other miracles have been sickness, someone is sick or they're born sick or they get sick or whatever, and and they're healed from that. This is a healing that takes place after an act of violence. We don't read about that anywhere else in uh, in Jesus' life. It's the only recorded uh, miracle that tells us about the restoration of a severed member of a person's body, that a part of their body was cut off. And Jesus was able to reattach it. So that's the uniqueness of the miracle, but it's also the power of the miracle. You know, it's one thing to to heal sickness, as amazing that it is, as that is, but you know, to take a, a body part and to reattach it, you know, that can hardly be done in modern medicine today in so many cases. Yet Jesus was able to do that and to to fix this man's ear. Uh, after it had been removed, you know, by, by a sword. So it's demonstrating, again, the tremendous power of Jesus, which, of course, shows us his identity. But the real lesson that we need to learn from this miracle is the compassion of it, that Jesus performed this good work on a person who was, was literally in the process of carrying out an illegal arrest upon Jesus. They had no legal cause to arrest him. He hadn't broken any law. He hadn't done anything that was wrong. He didn't deserve to be arrested or tried, much less to be scourged or crucified. Yet that's what they were doing anyway. And one of those who was in the process of enacting this terrible injustice upon Jesus was injured. And instead of retaliating, Jesus healed him. Notice again what was said in Luke uh, 22 and verse 51. We're told that the ear was cut off, and Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. Now the word suffer means permit or allow. And so he's saying, you know, allow it to this point and, and no further. Now, what does that mean? Who is Jesus talking to? Well, if he's talking to his disciples, it meant for them to allow him to be arrested, not to fight back, not to retaliate, not to draw your swords and to attack. Or it's possible that Jesus was talking to the soldier and or the, the other soldiers, and it means for them to allow him to heal their comrade who was, was injured. And so whatever it is, it's Jesus taking this situation of confusion and chaos and violence and stopping it and using it as an opportunity to do good, an opportunity to heal rather than to harm. So the Bible says that Jesus touched his ear, and he did it not with a fist of anger that that you're attacking me and you're doing something unjust toward me, and so I'm going to attack back and retaliate. It wasn't out of anger, out of vengeance, but it was in gentleness with love and compassion toward one who had been wounded and who had been harmed, Jesus healed him in spite of the fact that he was his enemy and that what he was doing was illegal, Jesus healed him anyway. And what a powerful lesson that teaches us. I want us to remember that Jesus, he says, suffer ye thus far. He also says in verse 52, be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves, 
When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Jesus understood clearly how illegal and unjust this was. They wouldn't dare do this when he was in the temple in front of all the people when his followers were there, uh, when, when just the general public was there. Because if the public saw this act of injustice and this mistreatment of Jesus, they might respond in the right way and turn against those in authority and rebel against them. So they wouldn't do it in public, even in the daytime. They wait till the cover of darkness in private when Jesus is alone. And they can tell any story that they want to about him. And there are no witnesses, save for these soldiers. He also understood that this was the power of darkness. He says, this is your hour. And he means that this is Satan's hour. This was the time of the devil's seeming victory. It's the power of darkness. And notice those who were serving the power of darkness. These soldiers were servants of the power of darkness. Now, they probably didn't wake up in the morning and say, you know, I'm going to serve Satan today. They weren't Satan worshipers who bowed down to an image of the devil, but because they gave themselves to doing that which was against the will of God, they became servants of the power of darkness. And there are a lot of people in our world who maybe even have good motives and good intentions and good consciences who are servants of the power of darkness because the things that they do are against the will of God. And so they put themselves on the side of the devil. And Jesus understood that, that this was evil and this was the devil taking his opportunity to to work in the darkness to accomplish a dark purpose And he was sure, the devil was, that this was his moment of great victory. But Jesus also knew that the only way to win this fight against the devil was to allow him to think that he had won and to follow through with God's plan of his life being offered on the cross as a sacrifice for sin. The devil thought it was a victory, but in fact it was his ultimate defeat. So Jesus was aware of the end of the story, and so he's able to endure. But just think about how difficult that must have been for God to let the devil look like he won. Can you imagine God humbling himself so low to allow the power of darkness to seem like it triumphed over him? What an amazing thing to think about, but it's how much God wanted and desired our salvation, that he was willing to even let the devil think that he had a victory and let it even look like a victory to the world in order to accomplish his great goal of our salvation. So Jesus is demonstrating tremendous compassion here, not just to the soldier that he healed, who's his enemy, but to all of us. He's showing his great love for us in allowing this to take place. He could have stopped it all in a moment's notice. He had the power to heal this man's ear. What could he have done to them had he chosen to? They had no power to arrest him, to to take him to this trial and to crucify him. It only happened because he allowed it to happen. He submitted himself to the will of God and allowed these things to take place. So it demonstrates to us that even in the hour of his agony, remember how Jesus prayed in the garden, and remember how his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood, the tremendous emotional turmoil that he was going through. In the midst of that terrible agony, in the very shadow of the cross, Jesus is still proving his power as the Son of God and a compassionate power in that he only used it for good and to help others and not to seek revenge. He demonstrated, of course, in doing this, his great love for all men, even his enemies. I want us to notice also that the disciples of Jesus were willing to fight and even to die for him, but they just weren't willing to live for him. You know, Peter had said earlier that uh, even if everyone else forsook him, he never would. And he made the promise that he would fight to the death to protect and to defend Jesus. And that's a great and courageous thing for Peter to say. And he demonstrates his commitment to that by drawing his sword and, and ready to fight. He's 
swinging for the guy's head. You know, when he cuts off his ear, you don't chop like this. He's swinging to cut off his head, and the guy ducked, right? Peter's ready to, to take on the world to defend Jesus. But Jesus has, has told them that that's not how his kingdom is going to be established, and that's not how his kingdom is going to spread into the world. But they're not willing to accept that yet. They're still thinking about a physical kingdom. And if you're fighting for a physical kingdom, it has to be a physical fight. And that's what Peter was thinking about and the other disciples. Jesus had told them earlier, if you look at verse 35 of Luke 22, he says, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip, and he that hath a sword, let him sell, hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this is written, that it is written, you must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. And what's Jesus saying? He's saying things are going to get bad, and they're going to turn against you, and you may need a sword to protect yourself. So they might need a, a weapon, you know, for personal protection and defense as they went forth from this event. But he did not mean that they were to use those weapons, first of all, to overthrow God's plan for redemption. They weren't to use those weapons to try to stop Jesus from being crucified because that was God's eternal plan. And he'd been telling them that that's what was going to happen when they came to Jerusalem. And Peter said he wasn't going to let it happen. And they all have had this idea <clears throat> that this was not how things should be. So they, they hear what Jesus says, but they're not willing to submit to it. They're not willing to accept it as the truth. And Jesus didn't want them to fight to stop God's plan of salvation and, and the plan that involved his crucifixion. So he told them to have a sword, but not to do that, not to go against God. Remember what he said in John's account, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So put away your sword. This is God's will. I must do this. And they weren't to fight against it. But it also means that he did not intend for them to force obedience to the gospel upon anyone by the threat of the sword. That's not how the gospel works. It's not how being a Christian works. We don't go out into the world to convert people at the point of a sword or with a weapon. You know, either convert or you'll die. There are some religions that work that way. And, you know, Islam is, is one in a lot of senses, but others, you know, cultist kind of followings that force people into obedience. That's not how the gospel works, and that's not what Jesus intended. So they were to put away their sword in submission to God's will. And again, that's what he told Peter to do. And the reason is because his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom, not a physical one. Jesus wasn't fighting to gain territory so they could set up an earthly kingdom, uh, you know, and have borders and, and houses and cities and all of those things. He was fighting for a spiritual kingdom, and it was a spiritual fight that would involve a spiritual battle and a spiritual victory. In Matthew 26 and verse 52, Jesus says to Peter, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. That's not the kind of kingdom that Jesus was establishing, a kingdom where you fight and then somebody's going to fight against you and war goes back and forth. That's not what he was about. He says in the next verse there, uh, in Matthew 26, verse 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? And Jesus says there, Peter, do you think I need your sword? If this is a battle that we're going to fight you know, to the death, I don't need you, Peter. I can pray, and God will send me you know, 12 legions of angels, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, and we can just wipe out all the enemies. We can destroy the whole planet if we want to. But that's not what Jesus was doing. That's not what the fight was about. That's not what the kingdom was about. It was all spiritual. <clears throat> Peter still didn't understand that, as so many of the Jews didn't, and as many of us today still uh, struggle with from time to time. 
Jesus could have won this battle easily if that were the point and if that were the goal. Instead, what he was doing was setting, setting an example for us to follow. I want us to read a couple of verses. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, first of all, where Peter talks about what happened on this occasion. And remember, Peter was there. He was the one standing at Jesus' side. He was the one who drew his sword. He was the one ready to fight to the death. And here's what he writes about what happened. He says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Peter says what Jesus did was to set an example, that when he was reviled, he didn't retaliate. When they said things evil against him, he didn't turn around and say bad things against them. When they accused him, he didn't in turn accuse them. When he was threatened, uh, he, when he suffered rather, he didn't retaliate by threatening them. If you attack me, then I can do something worse to you. He could have. He could have called 12 legions of angels and destroyed all of them. The miraculous power that he had, he could have defeated them on his own, obviously. But he didn't do that, and he didn't even threaten them with that. Because of his purpose and his mission, it was the salvation of the world. Instead, he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And I want us to notice this, that even though Jesus knew what was happening was illegal, that it was unjustified from a political standpoint, from a legal, judicial standpoint, and of course, obviously, from a spiritual standpoint. He knew that everything that was happening was, was wrong and unjust. He, he still allowed it to happen because his trust was in God. And even though he showed mercy to Malchus, and even though he restored the ear that had been cut off, and even though he didn't call the angels and he didn't destroy all of those who were against him, he knew that they were of the power of darkness. And he also knew that one day justice would come. His mercy and his kindness toward them is not Jesus condoning their sins. He's not saying that what they were doing is okay. He's not saying that they don't deserve punishment. And he's not saying that that punishment is not going to come because there's a day coming when it would. But in that moment, it was about offering the opportunity of repentance, giving them every chance that they possibly could have to make things right with God before justice came, before justice was served. And if that meant having to suffer as he did, having to humiliate himself and humble himself as he did, even to suffer the cross, he was willing to do that to give men every opportunity to make their lives right with God. But he was not saying that it's okay for you to stay in this condition and there will never be any consequences because that day was coming. And it was coming literally and physically for the nation of Israel with the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, which Jesus had already warned them about. But it's also coming at the day of judgment. And Jesus knew that that day was coming. We need to remember that. The Bible tells us, Peter himself goes on to tell us in 2 Peter chapter 3, that God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God allows this world to continue, and even when bad things happen and we look at terrible things that occur in our world and we say, you know, why does God allow these things to continue and why doesn't he just destroy the world and why doesn't Jesus come back part of the reason is he's giving us every opportunity as many as as will to repent of their sins to make things right with him so they can be ready for that day of judgment that is coming all of these soldiers witness this man who's supposed to be a terrible criminal deserving you know being arrested and tried and put to death they saw this horrible person 
heal his own enemy, to restore the ear to a man who, who had been wounded while trying to attack him. What Jesus was doing was showing them who he truly was to encourage their belief in him and their repentance of their wrongdoing. Ask yourself, how could these soldiers witness such a miracle and still follow through with what they were doing? To see this man do what he did and then still unlawfully arrest him and bring him to his, to his crucifixion. It takes a, a hardness of heart, a callousness of one's mind and of one's thinking to be able to do that. But Jesus endured it because he wanted them to be able to see and to know exactly who he was and what he was bringing to the world, making available the salvation that he offered. So he didn't retaliate, even though he could have. He loved his enemies, even though he had every reason to despise them for what they were doing to him. And just like Romans 12, 21 teaches us, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's exactly what Jesus did on this occasion. He overcame the evil that was against him by doing good. This servant or soldier was illegally arresting him, but Jesus did good anyway and healed him of the wound that he suffered. And what this is showing us is that those who were under the power of darkness and doing the devil's work, the way to defeat them and the way to defeat the devil is by doing what is right, by staying in the light, by being true to God and walking in the light of his word we will overcome the darkness of, of evil. And it doesn't seem that way sometimes. The world is so cruel and violent sometimes that we think it looks like evil is winning and, and triumphing and conquering. But the truth is that God is victorious. He always has promised us that he, he wins in the end. He is God. His way is right. And if we'll stay with him and just do good and serve him faithfully, we'll have the victory. No matter how dark it may look in this world, we know that light always conquers. And that's what Jesus is demonstrating in this miracle. So in the very, you know, the, the pit of darkness that he was suffering and enduring, and then this terrible thing happening to him, he still was able to do good and to, to stand in light and let his light shine to those round about him. And the reason was to show us just exactly who he is. He is, in fact, the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world, and he came to accomplish our salvation through his humiliation, through his suffering, through his sacrifice, and the shedding of his blood. Those who were there in the garden didn't deserve that. They were mistreating him and doing things that were wrong and illegal, but he loved them anyway, and he showed them mercy anyway. You and I don't deserve it either. We were sinners. We violated the will of God. We turned against him. We rebelled. We did wrong. Yet Jesus loved us anyway. And he went to the cross anyway to pay the price for your sins and for mine. Simply because he loved us. And he wants us to be with him forever in that eternal home of heaven. And so what he did for that soldier who sinned against him was to bring healing and what he does for us, even when we sin against him, is to offer us healing. He, he doesn't retaliate. He doesn't destroy us immediately. There's a day of judgment coming if we don't make things right. But he offers us the opportunity over and over and over again that we don't have to be lost. We can be saved because of the mercy and the grace and the kindness and the love of a Savior who gave his life for our sins. And I hope that we'll never forget that just how much the Lord loves us and the tremendous price that he paid to prove it. And that in turn, we will love him and demonstrate that by paying the price of giving our lives in service to him. Let's make the decision to surrender completely to his will, to follow him, living in obedience to his word, following the example that he set, knowing that one day we'll be together forever in that eternal home of heaven. That starts by being a Christian. And if you're here today and you're not a child of God, you've never obeyed the gospel, you have that opportunity to take God at his word, to do what he says, and to receive the promise that he offers, salvation from sin. Hearing God's word leads us to faith, 
believing in Jesus as his son and our savior, trusting him enough that we'll obey his commandments to repent of our sins, confess him as Lord in Christ, and to be baptized for the remission of sins. If you need to do that, everything is ready and prepared and we can help you. You can put on the Lord in baptism and leave today knowing that you're a child of God on your way to heaven. If you've done those things but haven't been faithful to him, if you've gone astray and need to come back home, repent of your wrongs, confess them, pray for forgiveness, and we'll pray with and for you. God will forgive. He will restore. The blood of Christ will cleanse because of God's great love for us. And again, that assurance of heaven will be ours. If you need to do that and we can help in any way, we encourage you. Respond to our Lord's invitation. Come forward even now as we stand and as we sing.